So that's the uh, work that I'm presenting here. So um, it's on allocentric spatial memories. I'll get to what that means in a second. So let's go. Um, okay, so I guess the, the so my lab's mostly focused on computer vision, and this is the, um, uh, you know, it's taken a turn towards machine learning like many other areas uh, recently, and usually it's concerned with what you find in images and how, and videos, and how you parse that into things that uh, machines can understand. And um, so normally, um, the algorithms that people are concerned with, they learn how to do things like recognize objects and so on. So you can see some examples here where like, um, you can detect objects like this uh, little uh, bottle there or segment them so tell which pixels are belonging to the monitor and so on. Uh, and even some 3D information like uh, uh, depth and uh, 3D structure, but always relative to the camera. So um, you can see that there's a trend. If you step back a little, uh, you'll see that they're all very image-centric tasks, which is not very surprising because it's computer vision. Um, but we probably want, you know, in order to have um, uh, machines that actually can reason beyond uh, images and see the world a bit like we do, then we probably need to go beyond that. So uh, we want to have a sort of um, machine be able to parse the world uh, into something that it understands. It's like when you uh, uh, stop seeing things, you don't necessarily, you, you don't necessarily forget about them. Um, so this is object permanence. And um, so this is, this is really what you need uh, to um, construct a more long-term view of uh, uh, what you've seen now and uh, use that to, to do some long-term planning um, uh, and have some, some goals and so on. Um, so this is important. So not to have just a sort of situational awareness that's um, uh, second to second, but actually be able to aggregate things uh, in a consistent view. And obviously that's always going to be uh, uh, more or less centered on the world rather than centered on yourself. Um, and that's really what the word allocentric comes from. It's the opposite of egocentric. Uh, so uh, it just denotes a, cha a change of point of view. Um, so as you can see, this is mostly for robots, but it also applies to self-driving cars um, and a bunch of other things. Okay, so uh, obviously uh, I'm not the first one to think about this, and people have been doing robotics for a very long time. Uh, and so they usually, re so, uh, they usually re refer to this problem as uh, SLAM, or simultaneous location and mapping, if you heard about that. Uh, and it's usually like a recursive uh, kind of uh, algorithm where you uh, observe frames. So as, as time moves on, you observe uh, new things in the world, uh, like frames in a video. And then from that, you're supposed to get your, an idea of your location, but also uh, continuously build a map. Uh, and as you do that, you base yourself on the, your previous estimate of the location and the map. You receive a new frame, and now you do that all over again. And so uh, you sort of have to keep updating things over time. Um, and there are many, uh, these, these pipelines are very complicated. Um, they have a lot of engineering, like very talented people spent a lot of time with them. Um, but they were sort of made by hand in this sort of engineering uh, uh, perspective. Um, and so it's, it's a bit like, it's very hard to adapt to new environments, for example, uh, because they were hand-tuned, and obviously we'd like something that's a bit more automatic. Um, and the other thing that's more fundamental is that there's no semantic information in this. So uh, these, are, these maps are usually composed of point clouds. Um, so they tell you about surfaces, but they don't necessarily tell you anything about what those surfaces are. Uh, a part of. So whether it's a door or a wall, it's all the same uh, to uh, an algorithm like that. Um, and uh, why do you care about that? Because uh, you can use this, this information to sort of uh, to compensate for missing data. So when you have, um, if your sensor for some reason didn't detect a, a part of a wall, uh, if you see both ends of the wall, you can extrapolate and think, well, you know, this is probably going to be the same wall. Um, and without any prior information like this, that depends on semantics, uh, you lose a lot of robustness and a lot of adaptability. Uh, another example might be uh, if you're walking, just your goal is to just walk down a corridor. Um, you don't really need to have an absolute centimeter level understanding of, of where you are. Um, you can just keep going in this direction. 
uh, and compensate when things get a bit uh, less good. So uh, those are important points about robustness, and it's something that biological systems have uh, that these, uh, uh, these systems don't, these artificial ones. Um, now, of course, uh, if you know about the trend of deep learning, which has taken uh, machine learning and all of these engineering disciplines by storm, lately you're thinking about how do you apply deep learning to this problem. And so it has resisted application for a while compared to other areas. Uh, and uh, there are a few reasons for that. So um, the first, probably the first approach was um, to just use, a bit, with deep learning, these are these, uh, uh, you probably heard about them, they're these deep neural networks. Uh, and they essentially consume uh, a lot of data and they learn very nonlinear functions uh, that are a little bit like black boxes, so there's some uh, black magic to them. Uh, so that means the first approaches were a bit more um, simplistic. So uh, what they've done is, uh, the first thing was to just predict the ego motion, which is the frame-to-frame -frame, uh, change in your uh, agent's pose. Uh, so if you rotate it a little bit, uh, or moved forward, and so you just predict that frame to frame. Now, obviously you can do that without having any information about the environment, just uh, looking at things like uh, optical flow and so on, but uh, this does not build a map, which you might be interested in for other reasons, to, for downstream tasks like uh, planning, navigation, and also it doesn't correct for drift. So as you keep accumulating these uh, frame to frame um, pose changes, uh, you will accumulate drift. Uh, so there's no way around that using this, this sort of technique. Um, so then a sort of more advanced uh, version of that was to use, uh, to learn localization, but now uh, learned offline. So essentially, learning a, training a deep network on one specific environment, so for example, this room, and to, for every image, predict the, the location where it is. Now. When you can do that if you have ground truth about the positions of the camera, so you know the, some associations between uh, images and uh, camera uh, or agent positions. Uh, but then the problem is now that the map is really only very implicit. So the map really only exists in, encoded somehow into the, the trained network. Um, so there is no easy way. For example, it, does, it will not transfer to new environments. Uh, any new environment will require retraining. And uh, uh, training is something that is a sort of a, a labor-intensive process because of all of the tuning you have to do. So that's also not great if you want to just deploy your robot and do that kind of thing. Um, so um, obviously then people try to uh, do even better. And, um, and so performing online mapping um, without encoding the, the uh, map, the environment, into the, the network's uh, uh, parameters, the weights. So essentially what they do is uh, you create a map on the fly. Um, this map exists only as the activation, so the intermediate predictions of the, of the deep neural network. And so um, this is a way to essentially build it online and make sure that it generalizes for new uh, environments. But uh, the, the problem with these techniques is that they, sort, they depend they lose the localization bit. So they take that as uh, granted, um, as just an extra input. And that's also not good. So they solved another part of the problem. Um, so what I proposed in this work last year uh, was to improve on both of these and b actually be able to do both mapping and localization with a deep network um, without, any, without assuming any other prior knowledge. So this is... Um, a network that builds a map on the fly and actually uses the map to, to perform localization, so no other sources, um, and it's able to do this fully online. So as it uh, sees new images, it will compile them into its uh, spatial memory and use that to uh, know where it is, and that's important. Um, okay. Um, so what's the special sauce? What's different here? Um, I don't think it, it, it might not be, uh, it's kind of obvious in, in retrospect, but uh, essentially everything comes out of just this one decision that you make very early on um, that constrains everything that comes downstream from that. So if you commit to this representation, you'll probably derive the exact same equations I did. Uh, so all you do is 
just assume that your map model uh, uh, represents the ground plane as a two-dimensional two grid. Um, so uh, we're not concerned about full three, the full 3D problem here yet. Um, and for each cell of this two-dimensional grid, you can associate one embedding uh, to that location. And this embedding is the uh, intermediate prediction of a deep neural network. So that means it's some semantic encoding. It's a vector that represents uh, a point in this semantic space of the, all the things that you can uh, see in an image. Uh, and so essentially, you get to associate one sort of visual code per uh, cell of this two-dimensional grid. Um, and just doing that. So essentially, this, this is a, a spatial memory that allows associating semantics with world coordinates. And the fact that it's world coordinates, not uh, egocentric camera-centered uh, coordinates, uh, that's very important. So once you have this spatial memory, uh, this two-dimensional grid, which is visualized here as this uh, cube, um, then you can read and write from it. And so given an image, uh, you can perform localization by essentially reading from the map, so accessing, uh, seeing which locations in the, in the, on the grid have embeddings that look like the, the one that you're seeing uh, in the image, and then you can perform, and that gives you uh, your position or, or orientation, so what, w knowing your, where you are, and then uh, you can perform the inverse operation, which is writing, and that's mapping. So given uh, the fact that your image sees some new things that you could not see before, and given that you know your position that you just estimated, then you can write it back into the, the, this grid of embeddings and just make sure that some, some of the embeddings that were not set yet, now you, you, you can uh, write there what you've seen that's new. And that's the whole thing. So that's the starting point. Now, once you do that, sort of uh, everything else will uh, come out of it. So the... Um, Main finding, I guess, is that uh, you can, if you take your image and you use the right embedding, which I'll get to in a minute, um, you can perform localization very quickly and very efficiently by just using convolution, a convolution operator. And I'll get to the details. Uh, but the other nice part is that um, writing to the map or updating the map um, actually, uh, you can prove mathematically that it's equivalent to deconvolution, which is the dual operator to convolution, uh, and that has a nice symmetry to it, I guess. So uh, the main message of the paper, and I'll get to what these boxes uh, mean in a second, uh, it's just that uh, you have this dual pair in localization and mapping, which is localization as convolution uh, on this two-dimensional grid, and mapping as this deconvolution. Okay, so um, I mentioned that you have to use the right embedding to be able to support this, and that embedding, uh, uh, that's, that's what I get to here. Um, so if you know deep networks, the first processing step you do uh, with them is to extract some features using, uh, from the, the image using a convolutional neural network. So that gives you access to a bunch of embeddings, which are these um, vectors that encode some semantics. Um, and then, uh, so what's, what's the goal here? We, we have this um, two-dimensional grid that corresponds to uh, world space coordinates uh, on the ground plane. So we need to somehow, and we want to perform comparisons against that uh, based on what we see in the image. So essentially what, what we have to do is um, uh, somehow get the embeddings that you see on, in the image onto the same format as the ground plane uh, embeddings. So to get it in, into that format, uh, what do you do? You just do uh, a projection onto the ground plane. Uh, so projection, uh, uh, projecting as in actually squashing it into the, this, from 3D to 2D. Uh, so we assume that we're given the depths and a calibrated camera, which is, uh, I guess, reasonable for these uh, robots and self-driving car uh, scenarios. Uh, but remember, these are centered in the, at the camera, so that does not make it trivial, because it's still only local information. As your camera moves around, you have no idea what those uh, 3D points correspond to uh, because of the camera motion. Um, so uh, all you do is, uh, given these depths, you know the 3D coordinates in the local camera space of each uh, pixel. So you can associate each pixel to a ground plane if you just project it down. 
uh, and then discretize it into a grid. And that's the operation that you see here in the center. So you see the camera in 3D with the, the 3D points. Uh, you see this um, green cell over there on the right. And essentially, all of the pixels that are um, tinted green, uh, those are projected onto that one green cell. Um, so that's all you do. So you just take the, the CNN embeddings from, from that, you aggregate all of them. Um, I used max pooling, you can use other things, uh, and put them all into that one embedding for that one cell. So what that gives you is what you see on the right, which is um, a local view. So uh, the CNN embeddings in the ground plane. Um, but this is still centered on the camera, so it does not give you a sort of world space global view uh, of things. So now that you have that, oh, and by the way, I represented that as this uh, ground plane square thing with these cones. So this is, uh, if you look at the camera view, uh, it's gonna, you ground project it, it looks like the blue shaded part. Um, if you've played top-down games uh, on your computer, then you know uh, what this is. Yeah, so just picture that. So you have this local view that's been ground projected. Uh, now, all you have to do, really, is to just find it on your map memory. Um, so we do this in the most straightforward way, which is just dense matching. So you just essentially try all possible positions uh, and uh, attribute a score to each one of those, uh, and that will give you the overall position. So we do that by, uh, that's equivalent to a cross-correlation operation or convolution. People sometimes use it uh, interchangeably. Uh, there are some subtleties there. And uh, then you just use a common softmax operator, which is used in deep networks, to turn scores into a normalized probability. Um, so this might seem a bit heavy, but these operations are complete, they're parallelizable and they're uh, optimized like crazy in these uh, frameworks. So this is really the fastest thing you can do, um, one of the fastest. So this can also be interpreted as uh, addressing a spatial associative memory. So you're given a query, which is your local view, and you're trying to find where in the memory it corresponds to, where searching the memory is equivalent to looking at different 2D coordinates on the, on the uh, spatial grid. And that gives you a position heat map. Now, of course, this is really only the position. Uh, and when we move around the world, even as you're moving uh, sort of attached to the, to the ground. Uh, position's not enough. You also rotate your view and you, you look around. So we need to also address that. But turns out that's pretty easy. Um, so to consider the orientation of the camera, so as you rotate around, um, all you have to do really is to just uh, consider rotated uh, versions of the view that you just got. So you see here on the left, the local view, uh, you just essentially rotate it artificially, um, and you get this stack of uh, rotated views, different angles. Um, so these are the possible views depending on the angle. And if you now search for those uh, with the same idea of using cross-correlation, um, then you will get, instead of just one map of the positions, you get a stack of map, map of positions, one for each uh, orientation. Uh, and so that gives you a joint probability of being at each uh, position and orientation at the same time. Um, and that's, that's all. So it's just used uh, as a filter bank. So it turns out to be pretty simple. Um, and uh, just to emphasize uh, you know, the big picture of what we're doing here, uh, we're actually going from uh, the normal computer vision uh, point of view, which is camera-centric. We're moving from this camera reference frame to the world reference frame. So the map exists on uh, global coordinates, world space coordinates, not on the camera space. And uh, that's the direction we want to move in. OK, so I guess uh, now the only thing that's missing is how do you go back? How do you um, take the local view and are able to update the, the spatial memory based on what you've just seen? So uh, the first thing you have to do is essentially to take your uh, local view and register it with the world space coordinates. So you know your position, uh, you know what you're seeing, um, you have to make sure you now have 
what you're seeing at the correct position of the map. And once you have that, so registered local view, then it's very easy to update because uh, each position of the world space uh, registered view corresponds to the each position of the map. So you can just integrate it with any simple uh, interpolation or anything like that. Um, and so it turns out that if you crunch the equations, uh, this comes out as deconvolution, um, which is maybe a bit surprising. So there's some intuition into why this works. Uh, if you look at that, so essentially you have this stack of uh, position heat maps, one per orientation, that's your position orientation uh, probabilities. Um, so essentially, if you imagine that you, you are absolutely certain that you are at only one position, uh, so you are at one particular orientation, that means out of that stack on the right, everything, every stack is zero except for one at the correct orientation. Uh, so that means when you deconvolve, uh, you will pick out the correct rotate, the corresponding rotation out of the stack of rotations on the top of the rotated local views. Um, and so, and then the deconvolution uh, with a, a function that looks like a peak like that essentially moves the rotated local view to that position. Uh, so that's the more pictorial uh, version of that, but you can also uh, prove it a bit more formally. It's not, uh, it, it, it's not that complicated, just no room for that on the slides. Um, and yeah, and once, you, once you've registered it, it's easy to integrate into the map uh, by linear interpolation or a convolutional LSTM. Um, yeah, so essentially, here's the full pipeline. Uh, I'd say it's pretty small for a slam pipeline because usually those are gigantic, so minimum maybe, I don't know, 10 or 12 modules with all sorts of different craziness inside. So uh, uh, all that you do is essentially uh, take your image, pass it through a standard CNN to get the embeddings, uh, ground project using the depth so that you get a local view, and then if you rotate those, you get this nice filter bank that you can use to localize yourself in position and orientation, and then deconvolve to, to re-register the, the local view, and uh, then you update the map using that. Um, so that's the, the whole thing. And I guess these are the two important or uh, surprising uh, results, which are the uh, localization as convolution and mapping as deconvolution. So uh, I started with some toy problems. I, promise there's uh, more inter interesting ones, but this is sort of a controlled setting, so we'll start with that. Uh, so I just generated 100,000 mazes that look like that. Uh, and I simulated an agent that moves at random. Um, and it, the important thing to be able to be related to the real world, uh, other than the fact that it's 2D, it's actually just that it's limited and very local visibility. So uh, if the agent is at the orange dot there, um, then, and looking up, then the only cells that it's able to see, everything else is occluded, are the blue ones. Uh, so once you take this local view, that's what I've shown on the right, which is uh, you really can't see beyond your uh, field of view, and uh, regardless of the camera rotation, uh, the local view is always going to be facing one direction that you selected, which is, in this case, the, it's always facing the right, so even as the agent moves around, the local view always starts uh, by facing the right and having this very limited uh, field of view. Uh, so essentially, you take this as the input. Uh, you, I trained it on uh, input sequences of five frames uh, to, uh, with supervision of position orientation. So it, the loss function is just the, um, uh, making sure that the position corresponds to the ground truth. Uh, with a logistic loss. And uh, after training, uh, this is what you get. So here's an example, sort of step by step. Um, this is a global view where the agent starts. And this is the first frame uh, where you get this local view, uh, as I said, always facing the right because it's local. Uh, and uh, on the, so everything that's gray is just the. Um, things that you can see, and then there's walls and ground. Uh, and then at the bottom, you see the, the position prediction heat map. So that's uh, black for probability zero and white for probability one. 
uh, and everything in between. And then the blue uh, thing is the ground truth, just for comparison. Um, and that's what you see on the first frame. And then on the second frame, uh, the red dot has moved over there. Uh, you get a new local view. Um, and now the predicted position is the predicted position heat map is something like that. So it's actually uh, seems to have caught on to the ground truth position pretty well. And then here's another uh, another one, and another, and another. And the result is always the same. So it's very certain of the position. Uh, you wouldn't think that immediately just from the description of the algorithm, um, but it turns out to be true. And I think it's a bit impressive because of the, the way that this is working. Essentially, the local views are like little pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. And in order to create a big map to localize uh, yourself against new views, you have to stitch together those puzzle pieces one by one into one larger view. And so by rotating and uh, translating them around. Uh, so that's funny. And then there are some more interesting cases. Um, that sort of test the limits of what this can do. So here's one where its uh, starting position is actually completely symmetrical, so the uh, vertically. So when you get a new local view, you can actually fit it in uh, both ways uh, uh, very well. Uh, and so that means that the, the predicted position is actually just 50% uh, probability of being at the top and 50% probability of being at the bottom, and that's the gray, the two gray uh, cells there. Uh, and the ground truth is actually the one at the bottom, but given this information, it's very hard to, or actually impossible to tell. And so what it does, as there are new frames coming around, uh, coming along, uh, it's sort of symmetrically propagating the probabilities uh, on this heat map of, of probabilities over time, but then essentially there is one frame where uh, it does not fit one of the possibilities too well, so the probability at the top starts vanishing, and uh, one more step and it vanished completely. So you can, because it's a heat map of probabilities, you can propagate this very multimodal, um, complex uh, possibilities of, of what happened simultaneously. Okay. Um, so I mentioned it's a spatial memory, and uh, so what, uh, what does that uh, map look like? Uh, so it's very hard to visualize because these are deep network embeddings and those always look like uh, gibberish to everyone. That's why they say it's non, not very interpretable and it isn't. I guess if you just plot the channel, so uh, I'm plotting one channel per uh, column here for different samples. And you can see that there's some of them correspond to things like uh, like uh, uh, free space or walls or corners and things like that. And that's what the embedding seem to encode. Uh, but more importantly also that the, these uh, local views are aggregated into a larger map. Um, and I guess you can't really take any more conclusions. So I tried to be a bit more systematic about showing uh, whether this actually encodes any semantics. Um, what I did was um, just label each cell of the maze with either being a corridor or a dead end or a crossing a intersection, that kind of thing. So those are ground, ground truth labels for what uh, each cell corresponds to. Uh, and you then train, train classifiers to, based on your embeddings, uh, the embeddings that I got from, from this system, that, uh, and, and see if it's possible to classify uh, space into these labels, like dead ends and turns and so on, but solely on the, based on the embeddings. And so chance would be 50%, which means it wouldn't really encode that. Uh, but it turns out you can, with a, a simple linear classifier, gets uh, way more than 50%. So that shows the embeddings encode some semantic information about these things. Um, so that would not be necessarily obvious because you're training the network to perform localization. You're not training it to get semantic information. Um, but somehow, along the way, the best way to localize yourself is to look for these semantic uh, 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 features of the world uh, and use those as the basis for your decision. 
Okay, so uh, I also did some experiments with 3D data. First one was from a game, which some of you might recognize. It's this old game called Doom. Uh, and uh, so this, you, you go from the maze situation to this one by only adding the ground projection uh, step that goes from 3D, uh, from images and depth to um, the two-dimensional view. Um, so what I'm showing here is uh, the images at the top where I uh, had to hack the source code a little bit and remove the monsters because they were messing up the localization. Uh, and so that's what you see at the top. And then at the bottom, you see on the left um, a top-down view of the, of the map in RGB, and then these probabilities as a, a heat map that sort of flares up a little bit sometimes when it's a bit more uncertain uh, about where it is, and the trajectory as one line. And then on the right, you see the orientation probabilities. So as it rotates, you can see uh, that it uh, more or less gets the correct orientation. And this was m just one way to visualize uh, the position orientation heat maps of the network over time. So this was done on uh, four recorded speed runs through the, the game, which consists of six hours of gameplay. Um, I think, so you, you've seen, probably seen some works where they use virtual worlds like this to test things. And uh, sometimes uh, it's a little bit disappointing because uh, it's very easy to just start from a small maze or something like that. And that's, that's fine to start with, but the difference between that and this is that uh, these are hours of gameplay over 32 levels that, were, that are pretty big and they were created to be interesting to, you, to humans and visually diverse. So don't be fooled by the quality of the graphics. Uh, I mean, this, this is enough to keep things entertaining for a human for uh, many hours. Uh, so it should be entertaining for a network for many hours as well. Or at least dif difficult, yeah. Um, so it's a bit. So that's why I think it's interesting. So then, the nice thing about the fact that the architecture I described doesn't really have um, a lot of environment specifics in it is that I took essentially the same, exactly the same network, exactly the same hyperparameters. I just retrained it on some new data, and the new data was from a robot platform. Um, so by training on that, uh, you can see that the images are a bit different now. Uh, so this is a, a robot moving around the kitchen. Uh, and here you see the same representation of the uh, top-down view and then your probability of being at each location and the historic history of the trajectory and orientations. So um, this, is from, this, this was trained on a subset of 19 indoor scenes. Uh, what uh, this data set contains is essentially, uh, if you want to work on robotics and you don't have a robot, this is probably the best uh, data set to get because it allows you to simulate what it would be like for a robot to traverse these environments uh, and with real images. And the, re the uh, reason why you can do that is because you have, uh, they collected uh, photos at every possible position orientation in these houses. Uh, with an actual robot. So, because they collected densely every possible uh, image, now you can simulate new trajectories by just stitching together these images in the right way. They provide a toolkit for that. So, I think that's cool. Um, and then you can do a bunch of tests on that. And I guess that's it for the results. I could go into some quantitative results maybe later if you guys care about that. I compared to some state of the art baselines and uh, some classical SLAM methods, and obviously, uh, yeah, so it seems to favor this system. And yeah, so conclusions. Um, it's possible to perform SLAM entirely online with these deep, ar deep neural networks. Um, the other funny finding was that location mapping are, can be uh, expressed as a dual pair of convolution deconvolution, and that you actually get some semantics out of that. And uh, then this is supposed to be a framework that supports uh, long-term goals and navigation, and that will be essentially the next step. Uh, yeah, and that's it for the first part of the talk. So now I don't know if I still have uh, enough time. Half an hour. Half an hour. Okay, great. That's exactly how long I need. So I can go... Hmm? 25 minutes, yeah. That's all right. 
So I'm going to give you only 30 seconds to breathe and then move on to the completely different topic. Okay. So just flush out everything that you just heard. And <laughs> uh, yeah. So the other, the other part was a bit more uh, application focused and uh, visual. This one is unfortunately not as visual. It's a slightly bit more theoretical, but uh, it also has, so I'll skip over some of the technical details in the interest of brevity, but it's also um, just interesting for the sort of um, different point of view when you consider something like meta learning. Um, so this is about meta learning, I'll get into that. Um, how many of you heard about it before? Uh, wow, OK, I'm, I'm impressed that five people have heard about it, because it's uh, maybe a bit uh, obscure. OK, so this is some work uh, which is presented this year at the ICLR. OK, so what's the goal here? Um, the main goal of meta learning, like the interest in it, is to perform this task, this application called one-shot learning. Uh, so one-shot learning uh, is a part, one small part of the holy grail of uh, machine learning, which is to essentially learn a new concept from just one or very few examples. So this is something that humans can do very effortly, effortlessly. Uh, that's why you're watching these uh, talks. Uh, and then uh, we obviously would like to have systems that can have uh, some form of these uh, ability. Um, so some examples, maybe they're not the best ones, but in systems that exist today, uh, would be specializing OCR, like uh, optical recognition to new writers or alphabets. So on your phone, you probably have some form of adaptation for uh, the way that you uh, write. Uh, that can also work for uh, handwriting. And then, uh, for example, single object tracking, where you're given a, you, you just meet a new object, a new uh, thing you're interested in, and then you have to follow it around. That's another example. Uh, but obviously, generalizing to concepts, uh, that's really the end goal. So I'm going to go a bit over um, how to this approach, what's this approach to one-shot learning? Because on the face of it, it seems very uh, unattainable to be able to solve something uh, like this in, in very difficult settings. Okay, so this is what meta learning is. Essentially, you take your learning algorithm and you put a new learning algorithm inside of it. Uh, so you just iterate the concept, and that's where the meta comes from. Uh, it's a meta something if you iterate the concept on, on itself. Um, so you take a learning algorithm and you put it inside a learning algorithm. What does that mean? Um, so to be just a little bit more concrete, um, you have something, some algorithm that can learn, some fancy, fancy neural network that can learn uh, concepts, just simple ones. Uh, so for example, this one that learns different kinds of fruits, uh, essentially taking examples of these fruits, uh, it learns, and the output of learning is a model, so something that you can use to predict kind of the type of fruit given new, new data. Um, so we don't want to just train something that learns some fruits and is done with that. We want something that will be able to learn for other kinds and also of fruits, but also, also other kinds of objects. Um, so the way you do this is you essentially wrap it, uh, you, you get a, a new learning algorithm that's supposed to uh, generalize over different tasks. So if this base learner is concerned with learning uh, different fruits, you might imagine other kinds of learners that try to uh, learn kind, different types of uh, dogs, or breeds of dogs, or different types of objects that you might find lying around the desk. So these are all different tasks. Um, so now you have a different learner that's outside, that sees a sort of more global view, uh, and is concerned with tuning things, learning uh, things, such that to enable the base learner to learn each of these small tasks more effectively. So essentially, uh, if you're given these episodes, which are, uh, I call them episodes, but they're tasks, so different uh, uh, learning 
tasks that are small and manageable, uh, you're given a, you, you, create, you start with a base learner that learns things for each episode specifically uh, and adapts really fast. And then you have a meta learner that uh, learns generic parameters that are going to be shared across all of these base learners, but adapts more slowly. Uh, and the important bit, so you might think, okay, well, that's just like learning one big model for everything. Uh, and the part that distinguishes it from that kind of uh, point of view is that the meta parameters that can either belong to the model, uh, which would be that, of equivalent to learning one big model for everything, or they can also belong to the to the learning algorithm. So things like the parameters that you tune when you learn the learning algorithm. So for example, if you have ever, uh, dealt with um, you know training some small deep learning model on these uh, nice tutorials that are online, you'll find that you have to tune the learning rate. So for example, the learning rate would be one thing that belongs to the algorithm. Uh, that usually the method itself cannot tune. And so you need something with an outside view that will be able to, uh, to tune that. And the way you tune that is by having the meta learner take a macro view over all of the specific tasks and tune a learning rate uh, based on uh, uh, for each one of these. Um, so in the context of a deep network, I guess, uh, you you can consider that this these, uh, way of training uh, networks is kind of like this black box, or actually here, yellow box, that's the base learner. That would be a standard algorithm like SGD. And its, sort of, it's goal is to output some parameters, uh, in this case, some uh, weights of a convolutional network, uh, so that then it can use, uh, can use those weights to classify a new test image and give a prediction about that image. Uh, so that's essentially a big abstraction of the standard pipeline. Um, now, you can now take some of the, so uh, this is what you have. So there are some hidden parameters here, the ones that you tune by hand. So uh, we're going to make those explicit. They're on the right. Uh, lambda, which are the meta parameters like learning rate, like regularization parameters, and that kind of thing. Uh, but you can also make them encompass some, some of the filters of the, um, uh, some of the weights of the, the network, consider those meta parameters that are not specific to a task. Um, and so your base learner now will only be concerned with learning a sub part of the network, but you get all of this freedom of uh, making all of the meta parameters explicit. So now you can try to find a systematic way to set all of those simultaneously so that they work across uh, all the settings, uh, all of the tasks. And the way you do that is just essentially by uh, gradient descent, so, which is the workhorse of how you learn these deep networks. So if you essentially write this down, this computational graph, uh, you can just ask your fancy uh, deep learning pipeline uh, framework to uh, backpropagate errors through that. So essentially, you cheat a little bit and you backpropagate errors from the test uh, loss. And if you make that bold step, I guess, uh, which uh, will this will give you uh, meta, uh, gradient, uh, gradients for the meta parameters, which will, so errors. Uh, how does how how does the error uh, or loss function at the end vary when you vary those meta parameters, and that allows you to adapt them slowly. So yeah, essentially, so that's the rest. So that's the whole meta learning business in this sort of uh, view which is you're trying to generalize across a bunch of uh, uh, episodes or tasks. So you just select one. Uh, you forward propagate, so you, you, you evaluate the base learner, which trains a small model that's specific to that task to obtain parameters. Then you make one prediction on a test sample, um, and you, you uh, essentially incur an error based on that, and you back propagate the error, uh, and that will give you an adaptation for the meta parameters. So, by doing that, you do meta learning. So I guess um, it's probably going to be best to. Oh yeah, okay. So uh, these I've abstracted the base learner a little bit. If you look at a lot of uh, meta learning algorithms, uh, they always seem to seem on the surface to be very different. 
but they actually all fit this sort of uh, framework. And um, if by changing the base learner, that's how you get all of the all of the latest papers on meta learning, uh, or uh, almost all of them. So that would be based on nearest neighbors, k nearest neighbors, just feed forward networks, SGD and logistic loss. And uh, the one that I used here was just ridge regression and a few other variants. Uh, so it was just by changing the base learner. And so now uh, I'm going to change gears a little bit and just explain what that base learner inside the yellow box is and why uh, it's good for uh, this meta learning setting. So the key idea is just to use ridge regression. So uh, why? Um, because essentially it's a very powerful linear classifier. So if you don't care about the deep hierarchy of features, if you only care about adapting the final layer, for example, uh, which is viable in this meta learning setting, um, then you can use a, a linear classifier. Um, it's trained in essentially one step. So just one closed form formula gives you the solution. And also, it's easy to differentiate, to get gradients or errors to backpropagate through the, uh, the training procedure. So those are all the elements that make it a good fit. Um, yeah, so uh, a refresher, just bridge regression is just uh, least squares. Uh, the least squares problem, that includes a little bit of regularization, which is L2 regularization. Um, I guess you can see the formula here. Um, the regularization is the, the lambda parameter there. So if you've used, if you've uh, heard your professors bad mouthing least squares, uh, then you should know that it's not that bad. The thing that gives it a bad reputation is the fact that it's unregularized. So if you add that tiny term of regularization over there, you get ridge regression, which actually is very, very competitive to very fancy uh, linear algorithms like uh, SVMs and so on. Uh, so, and this is something you can apply in just one line of code on any anything that you're uh, using. Um, yeah, so that was our base. Uh, one thing that's a bit awkward is that, so this matrix inversion, so if your features are too, if you have too many features, this inversion will be uh, large. Um, and that doesn't, doesn't really uh, help in a deep learning setting where you want to go through you know, millions of samples uh, quickly. So essentially it scales quadratically with the, the, the size scales quadratically with the number of features. So, so there's a nice way to solve this. Um, by using the Woodbury identity. Um, so it looks like what you see there. And essentially it's just, if you find, if you have something that looks like that, uh, and this matrix in the, that you're going to invert and add to the identity. Uh, it's features by features, that's the size. Uh, you can essentially exchange it, essentially exchange the order of the transpose there, put it on the other side, um, and that gives you, now the inversion is samples by samples. So these two things are equivalent, uh, which for me was not obvious on the, the first time I saw it. Uh, but it's a neat trick, because it means that essentially every time you have a, an inversion with something symmetric inside, you can um, exchange it for a smaller inversion. Um, yeah, so it turns out this is pretty optimal for uh, one-shot learning, because our base learner is supposed to learn from very few samples, and a lot of, uh, and very large, um, very large deep learning features. So the optimal case is to exactly use the one, the thing on the right. Uh, so it's going to be the inversion is going to be samples by samples in one shot learning. That's usually one sample or two or three or five samples tops. So it's very small, very manageable. While the feature size is usually in the hundreds or thousands. Uh, so you've gained a lot. Yeah, so essentially you apply that. Um, you can generalize this to other algorithms. I won't go into that. Um, and at the time when we published this, this was uh, state of the art. Uh, obviously, the field moves very fast. Uh, so these have already been beaten in some way or another. Uh, but the important thing is that uh, this is even, maybe if you're seeing meta learning for the first time, it's, it might be. Uh, you know, a bit of a, 
uh, mouthful, but uh, if you've seen other meta learning and one-shot learning uh, papers, it's, it's sort of, uh, compared to some of the constructions you see, it, this turns out to be very simple. So uh, as you've seen, like this is the, this is the formula you implement. It's like one line of code, and you back propagate through that. Uh, which is with automatic differentiation, which is what you get in PyTorch, TensorFlow, those frameworks, then that's, that's very easy. So in terms of implementation, uh, it turns out to be very simple. While uh, all of these other comparisons and the things that came out afterwards, they're much more complicated. Uh, so, you know, striving for simplicity, even if you're working within a relatively complicated uh, uh, framework. So yeah, I guess that's it. Um, I'm not sure if that's a very good introduction to meta learning. I've seen a few talks on meta learning. It's just very hard to describe intuitively. Uh, but I hope that was uh, elucidating in uh, at least some way. Um, uh, it also shows that you can vary the base learner quite a lot. And there are some that are more optimal than others. And this sort of says that you can use reach regression, which is just a very neat uh, small algorithm that you can keep in your pocket all the time and just use the Woodbury trick to make it very fast. Um, and yeah, and that gets you uh, one-shot learning on essentially image tasks, which I didn't get too much into. Uh, one of them is learning alphabets, uh, generalizing to learn new alphabets very quickly. Uh, the others were just based on images. We also tested it on things like tracking, so uh, learning to recognize new objects that are not in any, any category. Um, and that also works. And uh, I guess that's it. So yeah, thanks for uh, being here. <laughs>